Coming up on Mountain Men. Every time I run a raft in a drift boat, you always get a bit of an adrenaline rush. You're gonna be going so fast that it all happens in the blink of an eye. It's so nice to be coming up on this building instead of just a dream here. We're gonna get this thing built. Whoa, 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 whoa! What's going on? You're leaking through it everywhere! This population of coyotes, it's the highest it's been in a long time. What's that? What in the hell? It's a bone. That's an elk pelvis. On the banks of Idaho's Boise River. All right, are you ready? Yep, go ahead. Harry and Kid Yorin are on the hunt for untapped territory to give them a competitive edge. Harry and I have been down this river before, but we never had time to get out and explore any of this stuff. Cattle season is just around the corner, the time when the brothers will make half their yearly wage working as hired hands. Harry and I run cattle for a few different ranches. We're always kind of looking for greener pastures we can take them to for the summertime. The bigger the grassland area is, the less that we have to move them. They're scouting for fertile fields that can feed as many as a thousand head of cattle. The type of grasslands that are hard to come by in these parts, unless you push deep into the remote hills. But the Urans know all too well that getting around in the jagged sawtooth range can be a challenge. I got a tangle here. They've struggled all winter to keep their horses on the right track. Coming down. Son of a bitch. Now to save time, they've opted to leave their horses behind and brave the river in order to take a shortcut. It's really hard to get a horse down through here. There's no trails, there's no road. That's why this country is untouched. It's even hard to get a boat down through here. Hey, Harry, what's that on the side of the river right there? Looks like a boat. It is a boat. Someone didn't make it. They didn't make it very far. Early spring is the safest time to travel here before melting snow overwhelms the river. Let's not do that. And creates rushing rapids that can easily take out a small boat. But navigating the Boise is not for the inexperienced. Once we start on this, we are committed. There's nothing you can do to bail out. You have to go all the way through to the road. If something happens to the boat, that means we're walking. All right, we're getting into more white water. A little faster drop, narrower canyon. I'm getting a lot cliffier. So we got some more water coming in. Now you can see why not a lot of people come down here. There's more and more water building up. The water's getting stronger, faster, and bigger as we go down the canyon. You can hear the rapids. You can hear it from a long ways away. I mean, it's a roar. Yeah, this is that blind corner right here. This is the top of that first rapid, first big one. I definitely want to get out and scout this one. Coming around this corner right here, I can hear a rapid right down below us. It's like a lake up above it. It stops so much water and it's all pouring off all at once, so it's making a whole lot of noise. Holy cow, that water's cooking, dude. I think I'm gonna have to go on the far as I can to that right bank. There's a rock underwater right there, I see. One of the places people get into the most trouble is the unexpected stuff, and the unexpected stuff is kind of hiding. Oh, damn, that's a boat sinker. You have to miss those rocks. You can get washed out on that really easy. You can get washed out on that really easy. I can't, because I'm not going to be in the boat. Kid is an expert river runner with years of experience tackling whitewater. Having a lot of weight in the boat is going to make it hard for me to slow down, so we decide it's best if Harry walks around with the dogs and I just pick him up down below. But rapids are unpredictable, so he's not leaving anything to chance. Well, wish me luck. Looks a little different from down here. Every time I run a rapid in a drift boat, you always get a bit of an adrenaline rush. It, it'll hit you right when you're at the top of the rapid, you'll get chills in your spine just coming up. Pretty damn swift! You can't see, you're gonna be going so fast that it all happens in the blink of an eye to you. Slow down a bit. Come on.
in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Eustace Conway's 19-year-old apprentice, Raleigh Avery, is finally getting back to work. Let's see if we can get this next one. After two weeks on the sidelines with a crushing injury. Oh! Eustace! What happened? Oh. That daggum log came down on it. So you did break it. You got it pretty good right in the shaft of it. Man, this is frustrating just using one hand, Eustace. Yeah, I know. All I know is just don't put that hand between logs again. Yep. Eustace had been racing to complete the build of a lookout cabin on the far edge of his property to help deter the people who've been trespassing on his land. Mm. But now he's short-handed while Raleigh recovers. My hand's healing up pretty good, but I still can't put a lot of pressure on it. So while there's some work I can do, I really can't be lifting these big, heavy logs. So today, he's called in reinforcements. Hey! <laughs> Look what we got! Oh, <laughs> yeah. So we're in a real bind here trying to get everything done. So I called the Roberts boys, Preston Sons, and they said they could come on over and help out. And it made my day to hear that. I'm so glad you came out. Good to see you. I heard that uh, Raleigh busted his hand up and they needed some help and stuff. I was happy to help. What's up, James? How are you, brother? The mission for today is to mill enough boards to finish the walls of the cabin. And we're excited about y'all being here helping because yeah. a log like that is a lot to roll around. The last year, Joseph worked with me at the sawmill, so now he knows how to do this thing with all this muscle. I hope we'll be able to get these cabin logs sawed and get them up before those trespassers set back in. Each board needs to be 16 feet long and five inches thick. The trick with getting these cabin logs out, get them sawed down to the right thickness, is to take all the waste off the edge and end up with just the right thickness for the cabin log in the middle. And if you do it wrong, you could ruin one or both logs. Not on like waste. Roll them all over. But it's tricky getting it just right. I'm trying to get two cabin logs out of each one of these saw logs, and you have to cut it just right down the middle and just in the grain where you mess one of the logs up. Some wedges and a hammer. I've got a huge blade on this saw, but even as big as it is, it won't go through these massive logs. So what we're doing is taking a old primitive way. We're taking wedges and just lining up the wedge precisely with the saw cut and just split the rest of it. Probably need to put another one in about two inches up from that crack. Just follow it up, yeah. line one up, put one in from the end right there. It's like a big piece of firewood. You just have to be really careful to get that wedge lined up perfect or you damage or destroy your logs. Let's let her on down. This is just one of those days where I really need all this manpower around here. We're going to rip through this and make these cabin logs stack up fast. In Montana's Yak Valley. All right, man. Let's go get them. Here we go. Veteran trapper Tom Orr is on call to help his partner Sean McAfee tackle a rising threat to their thriving business. I've been checking traps over at my place and found a bunch of coyotes on. So seeing what Tom thinks to just let him decide what we do. Sean's been running the trap line on his new property this winter, which has so far been producing good fur. We've been doing real good on this new land that he bought. We caught a bunch of beaver and some martin and some ermine. But coyotes are predators whose diet depends on the same small animals that Tom and Sean trap to make their living. If the pack is left undisturbed, it could scare away the fur bearers just as the final push of the trapping season begins. Tom's plan is to track the pack and set some snares. The main thing is find the main trails that they mostly travel most of the time. And you can go along them trails and you can find their tracks, you know, so you know if they're traveling. It. Well, there's one of them anyway, huh? Yep. Big old long stride on them. Yeah, he's moving through here. Yeah, they're, they're loping up through here. Yeah. They're traveling, they ain't just walking. The first rule of trapping is to read the land and set near fresh tracks. Well, they've been up through here, ain't they? Yep, they sure heck have. 
Like the trail there. Yeah. Some coyote sign, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah, what's that? What in the hell? In the Yak Valley. What's that? What in the hell? That's a bone. Well, that's an elk pelvis. There's the rest of it over there, mister. Oh, I see ribs sticking up. A pack of coyotes is doing damage on Sean's new land. The stomach lining's eating off the... All the marrow out of the top of these. Coyotes don't often take down big game like elk. There's lots of coyote dung and stuff around. This kill is a sign that the ones in this area are aggressive and a threat to the fur-bearing animals Tom and Sean rely on to bring home a paycheck. This population of coyotes, from what I can see, it's the highest it's been in a long time. That can change the whole face of the ecosystem if all of a sudden one of your apex predators kind of rises up the food chain a little bit and their population gets high. There ain't no wolf tracks here. These are all just coyotes doing this. This has been their grocery cart. Now it's a no-brainer why there's so much traffic on the corner of my property. I think what we need to do is just we'll work a great big, huge circle all around here, find the trails that are coming in. Let's go get them. Sean and I, we're just going to work his property. We've got quite a few trails that come through his property, and there's a coyote track on almost every trail. Look at that there, Tom. Good trail, nice and narrow down in there. Yeah, it looks like a good spot from here. Now let's stick a snare in there. A snare is a piece of cable that has a loop in it, and you hang it over the trail in such a way that as the coyote comes down the trail, he runs his head through it. Normally, with a good neck catch, the coyote's dead in two or three minutes. But setting a snare properly requires expert skill. With a snare, the first thing you have to do is put sticks from a tree that'll go over the trail. So when the deer and the elk get to that snare, they step over it, the coyote will go under it, and that's where the snare's hung. What do you think of this trail going into that snowless spot? I think we could probably put something in there. Tom uses foothold traps where there's no place to camouflage a snare, but they must be well hidden in order to fool a coyote. Traps buried in, in wet snow will freeze up and won't fire. So it's, it's better to bury them in dirt rather than snow. The trap has to be below the top of the ground. And then I use wax paper. So now we've got a good base to set the trap up. Now this is dirt that has melted wax in it. Wax prevents the dirt from freezing. Without it, ice can lock the trap spring in place and cause it to malfunction. That's the biggest helpful thing for traps in the snow in the winter time. Now what you want to do, you want to try to camouflage that. And this is my coyote urine. Coyotes are drawn to the scent of urine, either in search of a mate or to mark their territory. So they sniff it, that's just far enough away from his nose for his front foot to be. If it's a male that comes in to urinate on it, he'll walk past it this way or this way to urinate. Right, could even end up in a back foot catch. For good, yep. good. Cool, get out of here. It is like a game, really. It's a thing where you put out your traps and you give it your best and hope that things work. The more sets you have out, the more chances you have to of, of making catches. At the Hawk Forge in Arkansas's Ozark Mountains. There's iron quite a bit. Jason's ready for round two in his quest to make his own homegrown steel. After the big furnace went down, I screwed around with a bunch of different designs. His first attempt to melt down iron ore went up in flames. Not what I wanted to do. Oh, that sucks. The experiment was supposed to save him thousands of dollars in raw material, but instead, it cost him valuable time. It was pretty much a fabulous disaster, I think is how you would term it. 
Now he's scaled down the experiment with a smelter half the size to replicate the things he did right and correct what went wrong. One of the biggest things that I did that was different, I put a door on it. I used one of the bricks so I can slide it out. And if I run into trouble, I can pull that bloom out. But he's not taking any chances with the precious iron ore he mined by hand. Until he can prove the furnace works, he'll run tests using cheap scrap. We're going to let this rod continue until it melts through. Then we're going to add another rod. We're going to keep doing that until everything's melting down there. We want to give it some time so it has time to absorb the carbon into it. The longer and hotter the metal cooks, the more carbon it absorbs from the charcoal and the more malleable it becomes. But it's not a precise recipe. And if it cooks too long, Oof. it can become too brittle to hold an edge. This is where it gets interesting. There we go. Oof. Now that we've cooled down this puck a little bit, it's time to go ahead and cut this thing open. I'm really curious to see what it looks like on the inside before I run another batch. I can tell it's definitely really high carbon. It's there, it's roasted, but I can definitely see on the inside some little air pockets. It's not as dense as I'd like it to be. Yeah, this one's a bit overcooked. So I'm gonna make a couple adjustments and we're gonna run this again. It's no different than I've told my son. Start screwing up. That's where you're gonna start learning. Come on. Harry and Kid have reached the first big rapid on the remote Boise River. Come on. But it's even bigger than the brothers realized. Ooh, catch it, Eddie, kiddo. Catch it, Eddie. One wrong move can sink a boat this size. Holy hell. Come on. Ah! Pretty damn swift. He misses all the rocks. Well, most of them. I think he might have bumped a couple, but he'll never tell me that. Kid makes it through this run unscathed. But up ahead, the waters are even more challenging. Before you even see these rapids, you can hear them coming. They're really loud. They sound like a jet. And they still have four miles to go to reach the backcountry they're trying to scout. They're uh, forced to be reckoned with. Look at those rocks down in these waves right here. This storm looks like the scariest one so far. It's a really fast rapid with a lot of boulders in the middle of the waves. Uh, I really don't see a good line through here. If I slam into one of these rocks at the oh. bottom of my boat, it's going right through the bottom of my boat. If you make one mistake out here, make an oar stroke at the wrong time, uh, you can break an oar, and then you're kind of what they call a creek without a paddle. There's, uh, there's no good way through here. It's really slow water coming up to it, and then once you pour off, you're committed and you're gonna be going really fast. Here we go. You better make sure you're dead on because if you're off by an inch or two on either side, you're gonna crash. On the Boise River. Come on. Kid Yoren is battling the whitewater on a risky shortcut to scout new cattle grazing lands deep in the mountain backcountry. Make it through the rapid, it's kind of like a weight's been lifted off my shoulders. My job's kind of done with the boat and stuff. Just gonna pick up Harry, let's go find a place to camp now. I say we just find anywhere that looks flat. It's getting late enough, it don't really matter where. What about if you just tuck right up in this? Oh, that's a nice looking little cove right there. We need to get camp ready, get some wood cut, get dinner rolling, and we should be good for the night. This works good right here. Yeah, let's just grab that stuff. I'll get this fire rolling just a little bit. Harry and I are gonna get out here early in the morning. Hopefully we can see some new country. I really wanna find some of that high mountain meadow tall grass that's gonna last all summer. It's pretty good country. I'm sure we can find something to run. If this thing has the potential that uh, that we're thinking it does. We could set up a real camp and do a lot of hunting out of here. 
I'm gonna sit down, my legs are tired. This could be the spot we wanna spend a lot of time in the future. In the foothills of the remote Great Alaska Range. Hey dogs, are you ready for an adventure? Homesteaders Morgan Beasley and Margaret Stern are taking matters into their own hands. Let's get packed up then. Heading out on an overland trek that will take them to uncharted waters that Morgan only just discovered during his recent flight home from a supply run. Get a good look at things. This big creek that goes by the property here is Stonehenge Creek. We're gonna go to this lower part of the creek. We've never really made it down to the confluence before. I've seen it from the air and there's lots of pools and it looks like excellent fishing. In the five years since Morgan first put down roots here, he's been plagued by problems securing a reliable food source. And though he and Margaret live near a vast system of low water creeks, none have proven good for fishing. It's really critical as we continue to try and subsist 100% off the, off the landscape here that we seek out a source of fresh food. Now, after failing to bring home any winter meat this season, they're determined to reverse their fortunes. But to do it, they have to push deeper into the wilderness than ever before. We're aiming for this confluence of these two creeks because there are um, a lot of deep pools and big rocks and eddies where fish might be hanging out, waiting for their next meal to float by. Well, I think this is as far as our trail goes. We've got a trail cleared about a mile and a half, but now we're gonna be scouting. The trail ahead is a complete unknown. With the compass, I can locate us to within a couple hundred yards on the map to scout the most efficient route. I mean, we're gonna weave around some depending on like local obstacles, but the basic trajectory we wanna keep for the next couple miles is gonna be 304. You just kind of got to trust the compass and try to be as precise as possible. And, it, you know, as long as you're within a couple of degrees of your intended bearing, you should be making a pretty straight line. You want to lead out? I'm going to go ahead and make a marker on this guy. Periodically marking the trail will help to keep them from getting lost and make it easier to find their way home tomorrow hang in ribbons in the trees so we can always find our way back in case our tracks melt out. But getting lost isn't the greatest danger they face. Oh, look. Nice bare rub tree, lots of fur over here. Yeah. Scratching up here. At this time of year, bears are just waking up from hibernation, hungry for their first meal in months. It's inherently dangerous out here. And so Margaret's got the 454 and I have the 12 gauge. And also, we got these dogs that can be really good at chasing bears off. So we're definitely going to be on the lookout. In the Great Alaska Range. A little corridor through here. Let me check the bearing. Morgan and Margaret are picking their way through uncharted territory. How are we doing? Uh, you're about five degrees left. OK. On a mission to tap into a potential new food source, the confluence of two rivers Morgan spotted from the sky that looks deep enough to support good fishing. Oh. Grouse under the tree. Fair. And while they may not have come here to hunt. I think it's right there mid-level. There's no way they're passing up an opportunity for an easy meal. Good boy, get it, Rufus. Get it. Well, good eye. We've been hiking for a long time, and so it'll be really nice to have a grouse to cook over the fire. You know, every little bit of protein we can get off the land here is good. I think we're almost there. This river down here, it just looks great. The water's low, it's nice and clear. It should be good fishing. Oh, I'm ready to drop this pack. And start fishing. We made it to where we're going to camp. We're going to drop our packs here and see if we can catch some fish. This looks like a pretty nice spot. Yeah. 
With the spring thaw beginning early, the river is no longer iced over, making this the perfect time to test its potential. I'm gonna start off with a shiny little spinner here. So hard to know what to use when you're just yeah. testing something new We're out. We're gonna try a bunch of stuff. This time of year, probably be some grayling, some trout, maybe some Dolly Vardens. But hopefully we can find this fish. Yeah, it'd be kind of nice. We have the fall hunting season, winter hunting season, spring fishing, and then summer garden. Be kind of a full seasonal wheel for us. Hopefully we're going to have a source of food for the long term. Deep in the Ozarks. Jason Hawk's finally on the right track after eight weeks of failed experiments. I like the way everything's melting, but in this first batch, it's not as dense as I'd like it to be. Now, after his first firing was nearly a success, he's fine-tuning the process to inch closer to his goal of smelting his own homegrown steel. On the second batch of rods, I'm gonna go ahead and dial the air back a little bit. Slow down my burn just a hair so we're not kind of going so nuclear into this. And I'm gonna shorten up my soak time and kind of see where we got from there. All right, well, it marks about the halfway mark. Things are looking good. It's feeling about time. All we got now is crack open the door and see what happens. Cool it off and see what we got. Nice. Now that everything is cool, I can see that this puck, it's solid and heavy. This is really what I'm after. The closer quality puck I can produce that's nice and dense without a lot of air pockets, inclusions in it, it makes it easier for the next stages. Out there, that's metal. I'm actually really impressed with this pot. That's pretty cool. I'm really liking the way this batch turned out. All of the little adjustments have seemed to come into play. Everything's working really good. So I've got to make one more run, run the ore, and hopefully I'm going to have what I want. If not, it's back to the drawing board. in North Carolina. One, two, three. Many hands make light work. Yeah, teamwork. And with Raleigh at half capacity, Preston's sons, Joseph, James, and now also Travis, who's recently arrived, have knocked out all 12 mill boards in just two hours. That's it. Sweet. Yeah. Ready to roll. Now it's time to finish the job of building the walls on the outpost cabin. Y'all holding on back there? Yeah. Yeah, boy, let's go. We've got several tons of logs on this truck. It's loaded down. And we have to be really careful not to hurt them, damage them when we're offloading them. And this is most of a cabin right here. He's going to need every bit of this space if we can get him okay. where we need him. That's good right there. Try not to get those logs too muddy, but we need to unbind it. Yeah. Drive forward about four feet. That's a tough old truck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we've got logs. Now we can build. We need to get something up pretty fast, just because these trespassers are giving us a hard time. <laughs> but I feel like we don't want to infringe on the quality of our work. I want something solid here. Eustace may be using power tools to help carry the weight, but he's still holding firm to tradition. Maybe a reference. The entire structure is being built the old-fashioned way. When we cut these dovetail notches, we make each log perfectly match the shape of the notch before and after it. Like, you don't even need any nails or screws, bolts to hold it together. The weight and compression, contact and friction, just nature holds it together. Now that we've got it notched on the ends, we're gonna set it into place slowly and carefully. You know, we've seen what 
a log can do coming down. We don't want another accident. We're just gonna put these logs together best we can and keep on going with it. Eustace is still learning the ropes of operating the track hoe. Watch above your head. It's a far cry from his usual system of manually operated ropes and pulleys. All right, so I can't see too good. This is what happened the other day with Riley. When we get these walls stacked up, it gets harder and harder to see. I can't see what's on the other side of the wall. I just have to rely on some communication. Lifting it up. Straight up. Straight up. All right, I'm out. It's all you, Joe. Go back your way, son, Eustace. Down. Whoa, 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 whoa! What's going on? You're leaking out. You're leaking fluid everywhere. In the Blue Ridge Mountains. The track hoe has sprung a leak with 300 pounds of lumber on the line. Let's go back down with it. Everything's going just perfect. And then all of a sudden, all this hydraulic fluid comes pouring out of the track hoe. Cut it off, cut it off. Yeah, kill it. That's a lot of fluid. See if you can figure out exactly where it's coming from. Right that's there's where it's coming from. Two. Look, that's a little bit loose. That thing wasn't even tight. Well, it is now. Well, let's see if that tightening fix. Can y'all see it dripping anymore? No. Looks OK from here. I think we're all right. And we might be back in business. So we just got one left. Slow down. Slow down. Whoa, 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 whoa. Your hook over here. You got to get it out from underneath those wall boards, which is considerable. All right, I'm going to raise it up a little bit. Don't have your hands in there. Yeah. All right, now I'm going to swing it a little bit more and let it down. That's it. I'm pretty good over here. Oh, man, that fits good. Yes! Woo! This is the fastest structure I've ever built. Some good help, Preston Sons, and the track have made all the difference. The only thing left is a roof to go over this. Hopefully this cabin is going to slow down the trespassers. In the Ozarks. Everything's ready to go. It's just time to fire this thing up and see what happens. With two successful trial runs under his belt, it's time for Jason to break out the raw iron ore and put his new mini smelter to its true test. So we're going to feed in a little bit of ore at this time. This right here is the future. There's a lot riding on this. All comes down to here. His recipe is two pounds of charcoal for every one pound of ore, layered to help draw out impurities and to add just enough carbon that the steel it produces is the right hardness for bladesmithing. I'm nervous, but with the last two smelts, I think I've got it dialed in. Jason's been humbled by this process before, but now he's hoping he's finally cracked the code. He already makes his own charcoal, Making his own steel is the final step towards total self-sufficiency as a blacksmith. Made the charcoal, harvested the ore. It's something I wanted to do for a long time. And to see it actually happening is wonderfully terrifying. Jason started this project to transform how he does business, but he can't spend all his time experimenting. Succeed or fail, he needs to get back to building the blades that feed his family. I need this to happen now. We're gonna back this off. This here is the moment of truth. The only thing I've got to do now is slide off the brick, go ahead, pull that bloom out, and see what I got. The brick stuck. That brick isn't going to move. In the Great Alaska Range, Getting late. We haven't gotten anything here. The fish aren't biting. Uh, There's nothing in here. It's, it's frustrating, you know, just have, having bad luck. Morgan and Margaret came here hoping to open up a new food source. And after just six hours on the river, they're not ready to give up for good. We'll just try again tomorrow. 
how about I go cut some firewood and you can kind of yep, clear up the... Yeah, clean out a spot for camp. Cool. All right. Yeah, this is a really nice camp in a lot of ways. Really good protection from the wind, close to water, lots of little skinny dead firewood trees. Clearing a little space under this nice thick spruce tree. It's gonna be good shelter. Get a lot of nice kindling here. Camp chores are better if split up. Fish, but at least we can cook that grouse. Here, help me up. I'm gonna go grab the grass. There you go. I'll cut a stick. What's that? Now maybe we're not alone here. Sounds like it could be a bear. In the Great Alaska Range. Morgan and Margaret are on high alert. Bears can get real close to us without us noticing, but we're just lucky we got these dogs. The dogs are absolutely invaluable. They'll scare them off before I ever see them. I don't know if it were me, I wouldn't get any closer to something that barked like that. <laughs> Whatever the dog felt the need to bark at, uh, I think it moved off. But I'm just going to be real aware and keep an eye out, especially with food around. Since we don't have fish, pretty nice to get this grouse. <laughs> there, there it is, right there. That's the perfect distance. <laughs> oh, there we go. That's what I need to do. Okay, we'll figure out tomorrow uh, where the fish are. Maybe they'll just be a little more bitey in the morning. We're always looking for as many food sources as possible to diversify. So if we can have some good fishing holes identified, that'd be really helpful and just make you know us that much more resilient out here. Hopefully you'll have better luck tomorrow. This whole thing is an experiment and a human, everything has a huge learning curve. Hopefully we find success. In the Ozarks, eight weeks of hard labor comes down to one moment of truth. This damn brick don't want to come off. I've got to get in, I've got to get this thing out quickly. Otherwise, metal expands and contracts as it heats and cools. It's going to fuse to the wall, and I'm going to wind up losing the inside of this furnace. This is really not the place I want to be. I'm going to have to go back to salvaging this thing by reaching in through the top. Get everything mixed up. There it is, there it is, there we go. Oof, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's looking good, that's looking good. Oh, it's great, it's solid, it's dense. You can feel it under that hammer. After like two swings, you can hear it start to ring back. You hear that ring? This is solidified, it's nice. You know what that is right there? That's Ozark steel. I've taken it from ore all of the way to smelted steel. Nice. This is exactly what I want. That's the start. It's been a long way to get a crusty little turd like that. But it's there. What's next is the work starts. I've got to go ahead and rebuild the big kiln, rerun all of that ore. But this, you know, gives me pretty good hope that that kiln's gonna work out well. To coax this little thing out of ore and mud kilns, you feel connected to, to some of the smiths of the past. <sighs> this whole thing's been like I've been chasing a ghost. And all of a sudden to see, yeah, it's not in my mind. It's actually real, it exists. It's an amazing feeling. Nice. Damn. It's a new day breaking over Montana's Yak Valley. Nada. It's still set. And ain't nothing, no action around it. Where Tom and Sean are back on the mountain to see if they've managed to catch one of the nuisance coyotes.
that's been threatening the trapping on Sean's new land. Well, we don't have anything there. Right. We come to our first foothold set, and there doesn't look like there's been any activity around us. On to the next one, man. All right. Hey. What do you think of that, man? Ah, 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 ah. A catch is a catch, and it, it still excites me. I'm 75 years old, and I still get excited. That's why I'm still trapping. Cool. Good looking dog. Good hide, too. Be worse than yeah, that. it looks like he'd be. Nice work. To see one in your trap is just fantastic. It's, it's, it's exciting every time. <laughs> Two of them there, Mr. Man. By taking out two coyotes, we probably saved the life of a lot of fawns and other animals. Lucky day for us, maybe, huh? Way to go. Bad day for the coyotes. Good day for the trappers. Next time on Mountain Men. Hey, here's a bear track right here been down the beach. I have to pay attention to what I'm doing. I don't want to step around the corner and end up face to face with a Kodiak brown bear. And coyotes, they've got real bad bacteria in their intestines and they, they start bloating immediately upon death. They can ruin the hide, so you want to skin coyotes as fast as you can. There he is. Oh, damn, it's a big old bear. Anytime your dog takes off on a bear track, uh, you gotta hustle. Yeah, he's got a hold of Mort, kid. Hey! Go up the tree! Woo! I see him turn around and smack my dog right on top of the head. I mean, it hit him hard. This is not gonna end well.